heard of the story of Trojan horse and the Battle of Troy in Greek mythology. Apparently, Trojans and Greeks had this long-standing conflict and battle fighting back and forth until one day Greeks delivered this giant horse to the gates of Tro the city of Troy and left it there as a peace offering. The Trojans wheeled the horse inside and began celebrating and taking this as a victory trophy, not knowing what's going to happen late, later. At night, when everybody was asleep, the whole city was asleep, this happened. So that giant wooden horse was hiding a group of elite warriors, like command these guys. At night, they crawled out of the horse, opened the gates of the city, and let the Greek army in. And perhaps you can guess the rest. So these days, the metaphorical use for the term Trojan horse, or just Trojan, basically refers to any trick which has got a harmless exterior, very deceptive, very innocent, but it carries, it contains hidden malevolent properties. And the most important thing is that these are unbeknown to the target. That's how we are deceived. So today, I want to introduce a different kind of Trojan, a biological Trojan known as Trojan female species. So these are female species that, again, on the exterior, they are not any different from their wild-type counterparts. But the big difference is in size. They carry a hidden genetic defect known as mitochondrial DNA mutation. You might already know that mitochondria are the organelles within all eukaryotic cells. And they are the powerhouses of the cells. And they're so special that they have their own genome. So hence the possibility of a mutation within mitochondrial DNA. Okay, so... These are Trojan females. What's the underlying malevolence? The consequence of female B having mtDNA mutation, the consequence is seen in generation male offspring. So the fertility of the male offspring is adversely affected. Simply said, the male offspring born to a Trojan mother will become infertile upon adult. Hence the term mother's curse. So this is a curse passed on to the son. A mother who is a Trojan female. Right, so if you want to look at it, look at the mechanism. So suppose that this is a Trojan female and this is a wild type normal male. They come at eight. Now the female offspring carry the genetic defect, the mutation. So when she grows to become an adult, she will be a Trojan female. And the son, the, the male offspring, will fortunately be sterile. Okay, so those are the individual level consequences, but there are bigger consequences in population level. So if the Trojan females, the numbers persist in a population, what happens? So we have generation after generations of Trojan females be produced in the population, that will gradually decrease the number of fertile males, or it will increase the number of sterile males within the population. And that will have an effect on the breeding rate, and hence the population viability will be threatened. So as you see here in this diagram, as the number of Trojan females increases, the number of fertile males over time will go down, and that will basically bring the population back. So, before I show this, um, there are populations, there are species that are called endangered, meaning they struggle to keep up their numbers. And we know a lot of examples, birds, fish. Now, if this sort of a mutation establishes with those species, it, the result is going to be a disaster. You know, they will be driven to extinction much faster than we expect. But there are creatures that we want to get rid of them. And if not completely get rid of them, at least we want to bring their population numbers 
under control. So this is a possum, brush-tailed possum, which is a pest in a country like New Zealand. Interesting fact is that in Australia, the neighboring country, possums are protected. So you cannot touch them. And, you know, the mosquito responsible for malaria. So these are classified as pests. And the thing with pests is that these are abundant and invasive. So any new territory that these are introduced, they multiply quickly and invade the area. Also, they're responsible for carrying and causing diseases. For example, again, the brush-tailed possum is a vector or is it responsible for transmitting bovine tuberculosis to cows? And in a country where a major industry is dairy and meat, so that's a big risk. Also, we know they consume and damage our crops. Overall, with all of these activities, pests drive global environmental change. And uh, obviously, the humankind has been battling with pests and this battle basically spans millennia. Some conventional methods that we have come up with is aerial poisoning or setting up poisoning stations in, in forests. That 1080 is again quite frequently used back in New Zealand. Setting up traps again in forests to catch weasels, dozens, giant rats, and the old technique of shooting or calling or hunting them. Now these come with challenges. Obviously they are costly and they need to be repeatedly applied basically. Poisoning campaigns for example and these poisoning stations or traps need to be maintained and replenished so a lot of effort goes into this. Also bad for environments. I myself for example witnessed uh, several protests you know, people protesting against 1080 in New Zealand because they said it's bad for environment. The rain washes the poison down to underground water and it goes to rivers and our rivers. And also rather inhumane. And then again, there is the question of sustainability. So these operations, these campaigns need to go basically year long and, and uh, as I said, poisoning needs to be repeated, the traps need to be maintained. So there's no end to it. And, they, and, and the results are uh, abysmal. Now, scientists and uh, people in the environmental sciences and biocontrol have been thinking of better strategies. So one of them is fertility control strategies which is deemed to be the optimal, the optimal solution or a optimal solution in pest management. So here in these strategies, the reproductive output of the species are controlled, are manipulated basically. So this way we can control how many of them are born every year or every generation. So one of the earliest techniques is this sterile male technique developed by entomologist Edward Nippling about 70 years ago. This was initially designed and mainly designed for insects, for flies and mosquitoes. So the other name for it is sterile insect technique. What this does, basically, you see the name sterile male, you can see there. The idea is to dilute the male population with a lot of sterile males. So if we assume a homogeneous mixing, then this mixture will reduce the chance of successful fertilization because there are a lot of sterile males mixed with the other males. So let's look at this as an example. So here, a normal female, normal male. So if all goes well, the chance of breeding, successful breeding, is 100%. Now if I introduce one sterile male, what happens? the probability of successful breeding goes down to 50% now. And if I introduce more, the probability goes down further. Now, there are a lot of success stories, especially with uh, flies and mosquitoes, of this technique, but some drawbacks. So you see, one thing you might notice, to bring down the successful breeding to 25%, basically reducing the chance down by 75%, I need to introduce 
you see three times the population. So the number of, I need to introduce a huge number of sterile males into the population in order to achieve 25%. The other thing is that these sterile males, they need to be imported into the population regularly because after, after one generation, they die and they basically leave the population. So they need to be replaced. So that's a lot than a lot of effort. So, time-consuming, as I said, labor-intensive, costly, and also they have a limited scope because they work best with species that have got a very short generation time, like flies and insects. So, with other species that the maturation time is longer, this is even more time-consuming and more labor-intensive. So, we have this idea of Trojan female technique, which is kind of a novel twist on the SMT, basically. So in SMT, the idea was to import sterile males regularly into the population. Now we say, okay, what if we have a mechanism that the sterile males are kind of self-produced within the population? And if you remember when I introduced you the Trojan the Trojan females have this property. So the Trojan females, every generation, they, they supply the next generation's Trojan females, at least half of them, and they also produce sterile males. So this technique is, we can call it, self-perpetuating, in theory. Now, we performed a numerical mathematical simulation comparing the two techniques under some Simplified assumptions, but realistic. So, as you see here, that's the result. So, two population, I mean, one population, once SMT applied to and once TFT. So, the red one is the result of SMT, the blue one, TFT. So, here you see that's the early stage. That's when we release sterile males into the population. And here is where we release. Trojan females. Now, if you compare the two, you see the quantity of release, the size of release in the sterile male technique is substantially larger than the one in Trojan female case. Also, in the red curve, which is sterile male, you see a spike in the population. So, nearly four, five folds the population rises before beginning to decline. So, that puts an extra pressure in the environment. Whereas in TFT, you see that's nearly double, so it's, it's manageable. Now, one other important feature that you see here is that after this, after this, I should probably press this. So after the, around about here, 1,000 months, you see that the population of, the, the population that's been managed by sterile male technique is very low. It's very, very low. But you see, in the absence of any further intervention, the population recovers itself, and it goes back to where it was. Whereas with the blue curve, the Trojan female, this low level is now at a steady state, meaning it is irreversible. It's not going to change. So the population now settles around this low level, which we can say, again, in theory, that the Trojan female technique is more stable and requires less effort. Again, in theory. So, you might think, okay, how feasible, how possible this is. Now, we basically need to think of how and where we're going to get this first cohort of Trojan females and release them into the population. Now, mitochondrial DNA mutations, they're quite rare in the nature. And thank God, because if it was common, then probably most of the species would have been extinct by now. So the Trojan females, they need to be engineered, basically, just like sterile males. Uh, these need to be engineered in labs. And now with the progress that we have in gene editing technology, as of last year, fortunately, this is possible now. A group of scientists released their, their work that they were able using bacterial enzymes to make very precise changes and manipulations to mitochondrial DNA. 
So this is going in the right step, but still needs a few more years to polish it and to develop it more carefully. As we said, to, to do it rightly. Okay, so I want to close by talking about something a bit different. So if you search scientific literature on genetic biocontrol for invasive species or any form of biocontrol, you'll see a wealth of articles, papers, research, and reports. And uh, there's a, I only introduced you just one of them. There are a few more that are being developed, even more complicated than TFT. So the hurdles in basically on the way of these techniques become operational. So as you would expect, scientific, technical, regulatory hurdles, but these can be resolved over time. The scientists are working hard. But perhaps the greatest hurdle is whether the public will accept the technology. So the question that the public usually asks, or will probably the first question that comes maybe to your mind, is that will these technologies Will they deliver what they promise? I.e., will they eradicate pests? Will they eradicate diseases? So, for example, in a Pew Research case survey done in 2018, the public seemed to be supportive of any form of genetic engineering on animals, on wildlife, which was intended to prevent major human diseases, for example, malaria or Dengue fever. A good example of this is the African country of Mali, where people were open to the release of genetic agents, genetic biocontrol agents, to basically control malaria, to reduce malaria. Another issue on the way of basically comp that, that complicates general public's perception of biocontrol techniques and genetic techniques is the underlying science is quite complex and sometimes not well understood even by scientists. And therefore, it's not very well communicated with the public. So events like this, I think, is a great opportunity for sharing the ideas and basically communicating them in a fairly lay and easy language. Now, for example, a survey in the U.S. asked people whether they knew what genetic biocontrol is. Nearly 85% of people said they've never heard of this kind of a thing. And again, when they were posed with the problem that the what the description is, they were not sure. They had these mixed thoughts and mixed feelings. Now, the estimate is that the general public's attitude towards this kind of techniques will change once one or two of these techniques or technologies are actually operational, are trialed on a field. And the way that the public will be informed usually is through news articles, mainly TV or some major social media outlets. And one thing I should say, the media presents this kind of news, sometimes their own twist on it, which uh, may not be totally fair. But that's how their perception, the public perception, will be shaped, whether positive or negative. It basically depends on the outcome. So what I would like to ask you to do, uh, probably you are thinking, you are wondering in yourself, I'm hoping, and next time when you are with your friends, with family, the gathering of associates, if it's the right time, if you have the opportunity, propose this idea to your friends and see how they react, what they say. Or just simply ask, would you support this? Are you for it or against it? And see what their reasons are and ask for the reasons why they support and why not. Thank you.